first, I would like to have a moment's silence for Sleeping Warriors channel. All right, that's long enough. So, after I commented on one of his videos, um, Riley replied, and so began a rather long back and forth between him and I, with the rather arrogant pseudoscientist giving me countless questions, well, not countless, but a lot of questions to answer, as well as challenging me to debunk two of his videos. I managed to get screenshots of all of the messages um, and managed to download the video with his egg experiment. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to find the one, well, before the channel got deleted, where he apparently explained to another, like, flat earther, or the reason things fall down. Um, instead of, you know, whichever direction. So, I, I don't know, I'll have to try and scour the internet and see if I can find something on that. But for now, we've got quite a lot to work with. I will explain, for his benefit, why we know gravity is real. There are a few things that, that prove it. And sort of go into the some of the reasons why his experiment is definitely pseudoscience. Um, he doesn't understand the scientific method sadly just like many flat earthers <clears throat> you know they hit that Dunning-Kruger level where they just even though they have no understanding of something or very little understanding of something they think that they are far superior to the you know countless scientists that we've had beforehand that have proved that the earth's a globe that gravity is real and that have created rockets to send us into space so that we can even take pictures of Earth from space, um, which, you know, clearly they deny. The way he experiments is, is the same as, as the whole Flurf logic. It, logic, sorry, is just to, uh, just to warp his findings and the experiment itself to fit his narrative. He goes into it not believing in gravity, so he comes out not believing in gravity. One of the main things that scientists must be able to do um, is be, you know, allow themselves to be proved wrong, to better their knowledge and understanding of, of the world around them. Before we begin though, let's define some terms for, for his benefit. Pseudoscience. A set of theories, beliefs or methods that some people claim are based on scientific fact or method even though in reality they are not. Scientific method. The approach that science uses to gain knowledge based on making observations, formulating laws and theories, and testing theories or hypotheses by experimentation. Now let's take a look at Riley's experiment. This is an egg. No shit, Sherlock. This is a parts per million counter. Inspired by John's most recent video, if you haven't checked it out, go to his channel and it's called something like how and why I drink distilled water. Um, he used one of these and he measured the amount of particulates per million in his tap water. I decided that I could apply what he used, this little bit of technology, not science, this is technology. Technology is where we apply science to create devices that can solve problems and do tasks. Technology is quite literally an application of science. I could apply this technology and I could perform a practical scientific experiment where I could measure the density of medium, in this case water, and I could make this egg move all by itself with just a little bit of salt. All by itself but with something else. Clearly, Riley does not understand the exact mechanics of his experiment, um, but let's get to that in a little bit. I can observe my phenomena to be that some objects appear to float, some objects appear to sink, some objects will suspend in different mediums. Kind of, but not really, as you're only testing it with the egg and um, not testing it by submersing any other object. My hypothesis is if I change the medium's density, the egg will move. Newton said, if an object moves, a force is present. And that force is ba -da 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 -da, gravity. Gravity comes from the Latin word gravitas, meaning weight, and is the natural phenomenon by which all things with mass and energy pull towards each other. Before we explain completely, let's show Riley why gravity is an important part of his experiment. This year at the URI has been very space themed. And so we're making a very special demo film for you today where we're looking at all the fun ex little experiments that they've done aboard the ISS. To recreate a spacey, weightless environment, we took a page out of the astronaut training book and sent Kevin Fong, this year's Christmas lecturer, on a parabolic flight. Parabolic flight can create pockets of weightlessness by going into a freefall mode. And we wanted to look particularly at how water behaves in microgravity. The major force acting on water in microgravity is surface tension. 
In a drop of water, you have molecules that are being pulled equally in every direction by the molecules that surround them. The water molecules on the surface of the droplet don't have water molecules surrounding them on all sides, and so they're pulled inwards towards the center of the droplet. This imbalance of forces creates an internal pressure that forces the molecules into a shape that has a minimum surface area while maintaining a cohesive surface. This also explains why droplets are round. The spherical shape minimizes the surface tension needed, as described by Laplace's law. The effects of this force on Earth are relatively weak because gravity counteracts it quite strongly. In space, however, surface tension really comes into its own. For the first one, I have this wet towel. So you can see it's quite wet, but when I wring it out, all the water leaves and it's left pretty much dry. But in space, it's a little bit different. You can see Kevin wringing the towel while floating in midair, but the water isn't behaving like we just saw. Instead, it's bunching around his hands and occasionally small globules break free when he shakes his hands. Without gravity to pull the water downwards, the surface tension keeps water adhering to itself and turns it almost into a gel-like substance that clings to most surfaces. Water is quite special in this regard because it clings very strongly due to its hydrogen bonds. So this second demonstration is an excellent study of fluid forces. What I have here is a beaker filled with water and a ping pong ball floating on top. Now it's pretty obvious that the ping pong ball would be floating because it's filled with air, and air is lighter than water. But the question is, what would happen in microgravity? You might expect that everything would move upwards, but the reality is much cooler. The ping pong ball is covered in a layer of paint that makes it hydrophilic. This means that it's wettable, and so the water wants to creep over the ball. When we remove gravity from the equation, the ball sinks into the water. So as you just saw, water does some incredible things in a weightless, space-like environment. Gravity pulls masses towards each other. Just as the Earth pulls things towards its center of mass, so too do objects on Earth exert their own gravitational pull. This includes us. However, because the Earth is so massive, its pull of gravity far outweighs the pull of everything else on Earth. Gravity even pulls the atmosphere towards its center. Without it, the air we breathe would begin to disperse into the realms of space. Um, the water that is held to our planet in the forms of um, oceans, rivers, lakes, etc. would move away as well. And then the planet itself would begin to break apart as there would be nothing to counteract the intense pressures at its core. This experiment shows that without gravity there is nothing to put density into its place. Um, gravity is what pulls the denser objects down and even creates the buoyant force to send the lighter densities up. Um, they don't literally float away more as being pushed up by the atmosphere that is sort of pulled down around them. Um, relative density cannot exist without gravity and sadly this is something that Riley will never admit to because his entire belief and model, or lack thereof, would fall apart if gravity was real. My null hypothesis is that if I change the, if I change the density of the medium, the will not move. I will activate one of the hypotheses. I believe you meant to say hypotheses. My independent variable, my presumed cause that I must manipulate in an experiment, is the density of the medium. My dependent variable is the movement of the egg. I will also try and keep everything else constant. The volumes of water, not all change, just the density of the medium. Let's see how I'm going to do this. This is my egg. This is my part per million counter. This is going to measure the parts per million of both these fluids. This is tap water. Regular tap water. And here is the, I think, the first example of where you actually ruin your experiment. Um, part of keeping experiments valid within the scientific method is not to alter the constants or controlled variable. So taking a sip, which you obviously did just to prove that it's tap water, uh, changes the amount of you know, water in that glass. And as any real scientist will tell you, um, any change in the controlled variable will invalidate the results of your experiment. Funny how you, as someone who you know, tells people that they don't understand the scientific method all the time, while apparently claiming that you do, would invalidate your experiment right out the gate. Still, I guess we'll continue just so we can teach you some actual science. That is the same tap water, but it's been pretty limited to save some time with some salt from this to give it a density variation. It's going to measure the density of the tap water. 
So I'm down to take a little bit of time. Okay, that's coming in at 212 parts per million tap water. Don't know what that means, it's just a number. It could be unicorn farts, it's just a tap, it's just a number. In science, numbers are never really just numbers. Um, they represent something. In, in this case, it's parts per million, which can also be treated as milligrams per liter. It's basically telling you the number of units of mass of contaminants um, or minerals in that volume of water. You should definitely try to understand the, you know, tools and measurements you're using in your scientific experiment if you you know actually want to be able to have a valid result and appear to know what you're doing. So 212 is the recorded density of this one. Right, sure, 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 sure. You're, you're not technically measuring the density there. Um, you're measuring the parts per million. To get the density you just need to do uh, divide the mass by the volume. Yeah, you're not really doing too well, are you, Sunshine? It's going to be 214 now. So if you want to zoom in on that, it's 214 parts per million. Okay. Back to zero. When I do it to this one, this one is saying this is 302 parts per million. And if you want to zoom into that, you can look. Okay. So basically 200 to 300. Let's try this one again. 208. Yeah, it's about 200. Then this one's about 300. Yeah, so it's 200 and 300, right? So one's got 100 more parts per million than the other. For scientific experiments, accuracy is pretty important. That tells me that there is density variation between two. Technically, yeah, but it doesn't give you the exact density values, um, which is, you know, really, it's something I think that you should at least mention in your experiment if you want to appear to know what you're doing. So what we're going to do is so see what happens when this egg is dropped into here. It sinks and it's touching the floor. Take the egg out. Now we'll see what happens when we put it into a more dense medium. So once I've set it down, this was done last night, because it takes ages for it to dissolve and it um, gets to a point where it's saturated. And I've got some residue at the bottom that is salt. Um, so at the bottom at least it's getting relatively saturated. So I'm going to give it a stir to stir it up so that the, uh, it evenly distributes a little bit better. Because what I'm hoping to do is get the egg so that it's just sat above the bottom of the thing. Some people argue and complain and say, well, I'm not, I shouldn't have stirred it, I should have left it as a gradient. It doesn't really matter, because what we're trying to establish is, if the medium is different, does it make it splitment? Does it force it splitment? Of course it does. You're adding a denser substance to the medium. Um, so as gravity pulls everything down, it creates a pressure gradient, you know, much like our air, obviously. Um, and then when the weight force on top of the object balances out with the um, upward push of the salt water, it will achieve neutral buoyancy. In this case, obviously, it can achieve positive or negative buoyancy uh, if you're using different mediums or different objects. If it forces displacement, on the there is force. This is just an old table salt from your favourite supermarket. Other supermarkets are available. We can tell that the density of the egg is equal to the part in the glass where the liquid is. What I'm now going to try and prove is that if I change the density of the medium, I will cause the, the uh, effect by adding salt. So yes, you're part of the cause. Um, you're the one manipulating the independent variable, but that is still influenced by the constants um, of which gravity is one. And then, you know, after that will then affect uh, the dependent variable so that to give you your result. Uh, just like most fluffs, you're not really able to see the whole picture, are you? So if I can change it, because I'm, I'm an experimenter and I'm manipulating my presumed cause, my independent variable is the medium. That egg moves, I cause it. Indirectly, sure, but you're not the only thing acting on the egg, are you? We know perhaps the million's about 300. What we need to do is pour some of this in. Hey, what do you know? The egg's immediately moved. Didn't have to wait for that, did we? So, what's the explanation? Um, basically, the density um, or mass divided by volume of the object, the density of the medium, and gravity. Well, I mentioned this now, this is going to be much more than 300. However, if it reads anything 300, then I'll do it for me. That's me. I'll reset. There we go. So the density is reading around about 309, 308, 309. Again, that does not measure the density. You can now look at that on the camera if you want to zoom in. But I just made the egg move. So what's the cause? Well, scientific method states that the independent variable is the presumed cause. And I presumed that changing the density of the liquid would, with salt would cause displacement. Newton's the first law of motion states that uh, every object will remain at rest unless acted upon by force. And I've obviously created a force. Wrong. You've changed the medium that gravitational acceleration is acting upon. Gravity is the force in this experiment. The density of the medium has displaced the egg. The egg moves. That's accelerated mass. So therefore, Newton states that there is a force. I cause it with this. So this is the Wikipedia for gravity, um, which 
Riley is used multiple times, so we're going to use it as well just to keep things fair. Um, so this is what Riley normally looks at. Um, I'm imagining he read this bit and didn't read further because, you know, he seems to stick with gravity not being a force. And um, obviously, it seems like with most flat earthers, once they find something that fits their narrative, they don't. Uh, research it any further. So as we can see here, gravity is most accurately described by the general theory of relativity proposed by Albert Einstein in 1915, which describes gravity not as a force, but as a consequence of masses moving along geodesic lines in a curved space-time caused by the uneven distribution of mass. But if he'd only looked a little further, However, for most applications, gravity is well approximated by Newton's law of universal gravitation, which describes gravity as a force causing any two bodies to be attracted toward each other, with magnitude proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. It does act like a force, and so because of this, we can still use Newton's definition of gravity. So in, in this case, gravity is the force. So in scientific, in scientific method, the cause of the displacement is this. I caused it. I manipulated it. I added the salt. It caused something. I did it. I within scientific method. Sure, but you are completely misunderstanding the scientific method. If you assert that gravity in any way caused something in this experiment, that means you are adding a secondary cause. So for the purposes of the, you know, the scientific experiment, the for cause and effect, cause is, is really just the independent variable being changed. Um, obviously, you know, the, the, the constants do cause stuff to happen, but, you know, we don't really, we don't really call them the cause in the experiment because you're not manipulating them. Um, in this case, Gravity, gravi the gravitational acceleration is a constant because it's not being changed. You can have gravity as an independent variable if you were to conduct the experiment, uh, the same experiment at different altitudes. Um, at sea level, gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, at 100 kilometers, it's about 9.5 meters per second squared. And at like 500 kilometers, I think you're looking at 8.45 meters per second squared. So in this case, you know, it is the constant. Gravity is just there to act on everything in your experiment. And yes, it does cause buoyancy. But it is not counted as a cause in your experiment. Oh, all right. So uh, location change. Um, it's been almost a week since I've done this. Um, as I as I've done my laundry, I, I was gonna you know put this on, go back to the other room um, for continuance, but my uh, my mum slash carer, yeah, I know, terribly sad at my age, is um, is watching telly, and uh, I can't be bothered to shave at the moment either. It's it's, it's still a bit too early in the morning to be fair, so we'll just carry on like this. I think by inference. If you add a secondary cause by inference, you fall outside of scientific method because you can't infer an extra cause when you've already got one that you've manipulated. You can't infer a secondary cause and remain in science, within scientific method. Um, I think this is where you confuse yourself, um, you know, because <laughs> because you have no understanding of the scientific method um, clearly, and because you know on on your idea of Earth, gravity really wouldn't work. So you have to choose to believe that it's fake, just like space. And because you ignore gravity, um, you, you you ignore it as a controlled variable or a constant, and um, therefore you fall into pseudoscience right from the get-go. If you wish to move outside of scientific method, sure, be my guest. Infer that gravity caused in any way whatsoever the effect that we just witnessed, which was the egg moving. But you do so outside of scientific method. And we know by definition, if you are not complying with scientific method, you are practicing pseudoscience. We don't. But you've been there all along. I am saying within scientific method, and I am using my cause and my effect relationship, and I am demonstrating it with using this. I've changed the density of the medium, and the egg has displaced. Within scientific method, the cause is that and only that. You cannot infer extra causes that take you outside scientific method. So, in anticipation of any reaction to this, um, this experiment in the uh, video underneath or the comments underneath, if you assert that there is gravity so acting on this in any way whatsoever, you are outside of scientific method and engaged in practicing pseudoscience. Unless you can show me a citation within scientific method that allows you to disregard the cause, the salt, the medium change, and then substitute an alternative one instead, or including adding to, then you are outside of scientific method. You are practicing pseudoscience. 
just by way of footnote. It's interesting to think that the mass of the Earth is below this table. The huge Earth ball that we're supposed to live on. And that is pulling that thing down, isn't it? Apparently. Yet when I added an extra bit of mass to this, the mass even below the eggs increased. For some reason, the other one up. Um, yeah, because of buoyancy, which is caused by gravity. Because you're doing, you know, you're suspending the egg in a fluid. Um, and it, you know, creates a density gradient. It's the same as a helium balloon rising up, actually, because gravity is pulling all the denser objects down. As you pull stuff down, you know, whatever's lighter is going to go up because you're 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 occupying that that lower space with more stuff. Basically, you're creating a higher pressure, and you're you're pushing that object up until it finds its its relative state. If mass really attracts mass, why didn't the egg go down? Buoyancy. It's a rhetorical question. I don't. I don't want any answer. Just merely an observation. Of course, you don't want any answer because any answer within scientific method destroys your model. Um, yeah, it. It, the the arrogance of of a flat earther just continues to amaze me. Um, I really think I've had enough of it. It's it's already quite a long video, um, even with speeding up Riley's bits. So we're going to go to his comments in a in another video. We'll do a part two. Um, I do have some other stuff though that I'm working on that's going to have to sort of come out in between them. Um, thank you all for your patience waiting for this video. Um, you know, which my old system was just, oh, it's crapping out. Um, I've got the new system, so, you know, moved everything over to, to quickly finish the project um, today. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it, really. If you enjoyed it, please do like and leave a comment. If you're not subscribed, why not? You know, this is clearly the place to be. So hit the subscription, uh, the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when I do more comment. Comment content god you can tell i need my coffee <laughs> anyway um yeah aside from that if you want to support the channel i've got paypal and patreon uh patreon in the description i've also got my discord server down there you know please come join in for a chat um you know that's all free and which is good free is definitely good during these times um so yeah hit me up there or any of my social media and um i'll see you next time thank you